Welcome to Stampscaping 101. Stampscaping 101, but this is going to be a fusion video, meaning I'm fusing um, uh, the Stampscape stamps with another company's stamps or other company's stamps. In this case, it's going to be the Rubber Moon. Uh, pretty new set. Uh, it, I think it just came out fairly recently. And um, let's see, it's called the Sandra Evertson. Rubber Moon Elements Collection, and I've had my eye on this tree right here, okay? It's an outline tree, and it's not something that I typically do in my own line of stamps. So, we'll see how this goes, but I, ha I have my um, concept in mind of how I'm going to use this one. This one's called um, the SE7477M Earth, if that's the correct one, I guess that would be. Uh, yeah, okay, so I see how this is going. This is a uh, um, fire, air, water, and earth. Okay? Alright, so I have my ideas on how to use this one, or how I'm going to attempt to use it at least. We'll see how it goes. Okay, we have a lot of elements here. It looks like a lot of fun. And I do use other companies' stamps if you check out um, the Stampscapes website. And then you go into the gallery section. There's a section called the Fusion um, gallery. A lot of people think it's kind of a technique type of thing or a certain type of look and it you know they probably have a certain type of look just because I you know I don't know it's my kind of personal taste and uh you know my own private collection of uh stamps but uh, the fusion just means that they're just used with other companies so you know it could really in theory be anything. Okay so I'm looking at this stamp right here and like I said it's an outline okay now in like a tree like this, if I were to do it for Stampscapes, it would typically be more solid like this, okay? But these ones are outlines, but I think that could yield some pretty cool um, effects or results by utilizing that outline type of drawing, okay? And that's in conjunction with um, the white paint pen, possibly some bleed-proof white. I'll have to see how it goes. Now, I don't know, this is a kind of, kind of a technique thing too, which I'm not, I just haven't done before, so we're, we're going to have to see how this comes out. Okay, so here's my concept right here. I'm going to have this tree down below, but I want it toned in in the background, but this is an outline stamp, so anything I put in the background, of course, if I stamp this right over the top of it, all that color is going to show right through, you know, the tree trunk, the tr branches, everything like that. But I want those to be light in value. I want them to be like a white against dark. But I'm not going to take my time, because this is a really elaborate design here, and I'm not going to stamp this out and use like a, a frisk, paint on frisk, which is like a, it's a resist, so you can, if you put tone over the top of it, then you peel off this kind of, um, it's almost like rubber cement type of thing, and then it would reveal the white of the paper again, but I'm not going to do that at all. That's That would be, you know, take forever to do, and I'm not going to do that, so I'm going to try using this white pen. Not on everything, but we'll just see how it goes, okay? And then, uh, above the tree, I'm going to have this open sky and space, so it's going to go from kind of darker tones up here to 
lighter down here, but we're going to have the tree down here kind of reversed out a little bit against the background. Not completely reversed out, I mean white on black, but it'll have some lighter elements in it. That's the theory, and I, I don't know. We'll see, have to see how it goes. Now I'm trying to decide if I want this um, cloud to be in here. I thought it would kind of be interesting to use this one in here. Let's give it a try. Okay. I was thinking about just going cloud down here and then sky, but I, I think it would work really well. Do you see how this tree is like a, a real round type of um, shape here? It's more a, kind of oval. All right. This is one of the things that you can do in stamping. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. It's endless, but when you have such an obvious shape like this, okay, from a design concept, it's, you know, it's not a bad idea to um, reiterate. Okay, let me see where this is going to go. It's going to go right here. All right, let's go about like right here. I could take the time to blot this off on the edge. I don't know. I guess I've been teaching that, so let's just do that right here. So when you ink this up, you just kind of blot off around the edges, the perimeter, you know, and blot it off pretty good. Okay, don't be too gingerly with it, especially if you're going with a fairly dark color, like um, in this case, it's a Prussian blue. It's like a really dark navy blue. All right, so I'm going like this, and I'm roughly reiterating the shape of that tree. Okay, it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, we're not sitting there taking measurements or something like that. It doesn't have to be the same width or something like that. It's just generally kind of that rounded shape like that, okay, to match this. Not match it, but reiterate that type of thing going on up there, okay? I don't know. It just it creates, um, it creates a continuity in terms of shape in the scene, and that can create, you know, some visual harmony. All right, let's see. I'm inking up my um, Starbirth stamp right here. Milky Way would look good in there, Star Cluster, something like that if you're going to uh, stamp along with me and you know do the same uh, type of uh, composition. All right, now this, I mean, these clouds up here would look great too. If I were to just do only clouds up there, I would probably do them in two different um, tones. I would probably go uh, dark blue and then do a lighter blue in here. So it looked like an opening in the clouds coming down on the tree like that. But I'm going to do this one as a nighttime type of scene. So uh, Starbirth, okay. You can go for some extra colors in here if you want to. All right, now... I could mask off these clouds like this, but the way that I've designed these stamps is if you just kind of wipe it off on the perimeter, and like I said, wipe it off pretty good. I'm wiping, uh, removing about an inch worth of ink down here, but I'm not removing all of it, okay? I'm just kind of dabbing it off, and really dab it off pretty good around the edge, like maybe an eighth of an inch into it, just so we don't get this hard um, edge of this rectangle showing. And then when you do that, you don't have to mask off the clouds. You just stamp that right in there. And that merges in with those clouds just fine. You're, I mean, if I look carefully, I can see some of this stamp in those clouds, but it doesn't matter because it, it merges in with them just fine. Okay, now see this right here? This isn't going to fit in here. This is much wider than that space, right? But if you just... Here, let's just ink up the center here for the most part of this one so you're not inking up the whole thing and then just do that blotting off okay that's really important in terms of uh, scenic stamping it's the transitions you can tell um, if someone really knows what they're doing in their designs with their transitions and if the transitions aren't done kind of properly they don't merge as well so I've got this completely overlapping the previous impression of the star birth. It's overlapping the clouds, okay? But everything looks nice and seamless 
from that aspect, and we didn't have to do any masking. You can you can mask if you want to. You can, you know, kind of cut out a paper towel or something like that. And if I was to mask, it would be nothing more than this. You know, a couple pieces of paper towel like that. But you really don't have to. In most cases, okay. There's sometimes that when when masking is needed, if you're going with something super dark behind like a a rooftop or something like that, and you don't want the sky to be, you know, be right in a rooftop or something like that of a, like a cabin or, or that type of thing. But um, for the most part, you know, you don't have to do all those types of uh, tedious types of uh, processes in order to merge your, I don't know, your elements together in a nice seamless fashion. Meaning, you know, it's easy to merge them together with a bunch of things showing, but, um, you know, overlapping things, but overlapping in stampscapes is a good thing because you don't have all these spaces showing all over in here. All right. Okay, let's see. I have my um, tumbled glass distress ink reinker here. If you have the pads for these things too, you can use those. Let's just you know, go with our same paper towel that we just did all that blotting off with. Why not use the same thing? Okay, now that tree is going down here. Ah, boy, should I stamp that right now or should I wait till I get some tone down? Let's do it. This is an outlined stamp, so I'm thinking maybe I should stamp it right now while the paper is dry down here. What I'm afraid of is if I lay down all the colors down here, and then I stamp that right over the top of it, and then I start toning um, into these open spaces with that white pen, I'm just, I'm curious to know if it would, uh, um, if I'd get a really good solid impression with black. Let's do it right now and just uh, be safe about it. Now the reason for me um, stamping it after I lay down the tone is sometimes the impressions look a little bit more crisp if you stamp that over it than having stamping it like that and then toning all over the top of it. Not that it would smear, um, but just, I don't know, you, you know, when I'm applying a lot of different inks to it, um, my imagery, it can kind of get a little bit fuzzy, more so kind of on a microscopic level, but you have kind of this slightly, you know, slight diffusion over the entire image everywhere, then it might not look as crisp as it could look. Okay, so let's go from like this. Fairly large stamp, of course, with large stamps. Get plenty of pressure. I stand up when I'm stamping large stamps. Especially a brand new stamp, too. Sometimes um, in the vulcanizing process, when you pull the, um, the rubber out from the mold, um, it'll have a little bit of spray resist still on the stamp. Okay, so... Get it kind of applied down. Okay, so see all that? That's what I mean by an outline. So I'm going to tone over all that, and we're going to lose a lot of the definition, but I'm going to bring it back out with um, that white pen, and I think it'll look pretty interesting. Now, this is just one way to do this thing. It's just I'm going for kind of more of a graphic statement. I mean, you know, there's um, these little, like, flowers or whatnot on this tree. There's green, you can do green leaves and whatnot. I'm going for a different look than that, though. Okay, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Okay, let's see. By the way, this is a half sheet piece of paper. I just cut it, you know, lengthwise, so it's four and a quarter by 11. Okay, so let's go back to this. I'm, I'm using this reinker right here. You can do this in any kind of color scheme. Actually, green in the background would have looked really good. Um, you know, for that green tree. I don't know, growth and whatnot. Let's just do it in blues right here. Actually, I don't know. I could still go green because blue is a component of green, right? Okay, so in something like this, 
be careful that you don't tone out all of your clouds. Have some of the clouds, you know, the white showing, I think, just to have some of that light reflecting off of the clouds, okay? I think the clouds in the sky look pretty good if you have them a little bit light, okay? So see how I'm just kind of doing this right here? I'm retaining some of the lights of the stars, okay? Uh, some people have a hard time doing this, and uh, I kind of get that, but uh, using this paper towel like this is not, it's, it's really not a tedious process, right? Like an exacting process. Now, I know to retain some of those light areas, okay? But I can stop right there and not tone the whole thing out. So, as you're applying this, Kind of keep, watch your light areas. So see, when I'm applying tone, I'm looking at that light that I'm retaining there. So have a lot of your focus on the light, um, kind of light retention, okay? But this is not like a, a hard process to do here, you know, to go like, all I'm doing is this, like that, right? And it's with a paper towel. So if you don't, if you tried this and you didn't get it, I would suggest practicing a little bit more with it and uh, kind of get the feel of it. Some people kind of give up after like one time, you know, it's like, I don't know, I make the analogy, hey, you know, tying your shoe is like a lot harder than this. This is you can learn in, I don't know, five minutes or something like that. Um, but I do get it though. It's Sometimes when it comes down to something like this, if we're talking about a whole sky area, people are used to filling in whole areas and sections so they'll just tone everything out and then they lost all their light. But the difference between kind of coloring and lighting a scene, it's the same process except you're just doing less. Okay? You retain some of your light areas. Okay? So in a case like this, I've retained a little bit of that area, this, this, this. Now, why these areas? Well, because those are the, kind of the bigger stars, so I just, I'm just figuring, okay, those will probably be a little bit lighter. They'll be my kind of source of light. And then I put a little bit of light on that cloud right there because it's being bottom lit from those stars, and these clouds right here are being top lit. So the tops of these clouds right here. Oh, by the way, so when I stamped out that cloud, if I didn't mention it, when I stamped the cloud above the stars, I stamped it this way. See how it's being bottom lit? And then when I stamped it down here, I did it that way. So up here it's like that, down here it's like that. All right? And if it was on the side, I would stamp it this way. But don't sweat it, though. I mean, if this cloud was light over here and this one wasn't, it's not like a mistake. It's just, there's just an oscillation of uh, lights and darks going on. All right, now that's all you have to do. Now that's all I'm going to do with all of my um, incrementally darker tones, okay? Now I use this tumble glass right now. That one's a pretty light blue. This is a salvia blue from Marvy, slightly darker. And just apply it roughly where you used your previous blue, okay? So nothing changes. You just go like this. But the thing that's gonna, going to take a little bit more time is, I think, I don't know, is the uh, when I get down to this tree and start addressing it with the, uh, the white paint, white paint pen, I should say. I don't think it'll take too long, though. It'll be like a coloring book, except instead of coloring color, it's like you're almost doing the reverse because you're going to be coloring white into it. All right, so that was the next blue. All right, so you just keep moving through. Let's just pick out some different blues here. Um, this one's Broken China, you know, Distress Ink. I really like using the re-inker fluids, especially if I have a lot of area to cover, okay? Because when I take this and I just go like this in here, 
this really makes for a pretty sopping wet applicator, okay? Now you gotta be careful that you don't just tone everything out with that. So when you get a new color, and it's a little bit darker than what you've been using, just kind of go into your darker areas first, okay? And use kind of a lighter touch, okay? And just go right into it. See, I'm still retaining my light of the cloud up there. So just kind of watch out for your lights. It's really more so when you get into your darker tones, and the paper itself starts getting a little bit damper, okay? So the ink that you're applying doesn't soak into the page as much because the paper is starting to kind of move towards um, saturation. I don't know if it's super saturation, but where it's not going to take any more. Sometimes that happens. Now I need to go a little bit darker down here. I'm kind of hesitant around this tree <laughs> because it is an outline. But I just know that if I don't go, a, you know, quite a bit darker down here, when I apply that white pen into that tree area, it's not going to show up by contrast very much. Because if you go light into a light area, there's just not contrast there. So I had to go pretty dark. All right, this is Mermaid Lagoon. Okay. It looks a lot darker than what it, it's going to look like on the uh, paper. See? All right. Mermaid Lagoon has a little bit of warmth to it. A little bit of green. Kind of, I'm looking at my lighter areas of those stars, being careful not to just, you know, tone them all out. One of the things that you'll find is, if you take things one step lighter in your toning process, by contrast, the lighter areas seem one step lighter, okay? Because again, we're not working with lighting in a scene like this, when we're working on a white piece of paper, this is kind of reflected light, you know, coming from my studio lamps here over my desk and whatnot. We don't have a light behind this piece of paper here, so you're just working with contrast. So the more you want your light areas to stand out, the darker you take the areas around it, okay? Which doesn't mean you have to go real dark or anything like that. It's just how much do you want something to stand out. Like, for example, like a real pastel... Um, colored scene. Um, it wouldn't have the contrast. It would have a, a different look to it, though. Okay. One way is not necessarily better than the other. Okay. It's just different. All right. Let's try some Marvy tones. Marvy tone colors or inks are very bright. I'm just going to use the same side of my paper towel that I've been using, though. But see that right there? It's quite a bit brighter of a color. Doesn't mean I want all of my colors super bright. Um, I like to have a little bit of combination of bright and dull and dark and light, sometimes warm and cool. So I like a whole range. So I tend to think that Marvy colors are one of the brightest of all inks. Okay, just in terms of their their whole line of colors. Um, so I tend to use them a lot, but I, I like using them in conjunction with, you know, your mementos, your distress inks. Um, oh, what are some other brands out there? I don't know. I, I even have some old vivid colors from Clear Snap, if anyone remembers those. I don't use them too much anymore. Like I just, I don't use Adirondack too much anymore just because they're not being produced anymore so sometimes when people watch these videos they get really confused you know in terms of um, the media and thinking they have to kind of you know if they're going to do something like this um, they have to have the exact stuff that you used on the scene um, 
which I don't know, it could be, make it easier for them in terms of the, th the thinking process. But when it comes like this, think about it in terms of um, kind of the concepts of it. I'm working in the types of things. So I'm working on, this is glossy cardstock like this. Um, I mean, I could do this scene on a mat or like a satin or dull cardstock as well. Um, but this has a different type of look. But um, in terms of the types of inks, going back to that, one of the thing that it's important on this, if you're going for this type of deep look in terms of the, uh, the ink saturations like that, and the vibrancy of it, um, dye-based inks tend to work really good for that. Um, they're transparent, so the colors underneath affect the overall look. Okay, I'm going back into the Prussian blue, which is the same color blue that I stamped at my clouds in, and you can see that it's quite a bit darker than the ones that I've used, okay? But this Prussian blue over the top of all those other colors is not just totally covering everything up. This is just Prussian blue like that, okay? But you can see how much uh, richer it is when it's laid over the top of all these other blues that I've used so far. So it's not a lost cause, you know, so I always tell people don't try to rush into the darker tones. Go through your lighter tones because when you get to the darker tones, the darker tones that you use are going to seem so much richer and deep by having those other colors um, showing right through the surface of the darker tone. Okay. That's how you get those real deep saturations that are so much fun, um, especially on glossy cardstock. But I've been playing around with a lot of matte cardstocks and satin finish, dull. And I'm really surprised at how much depth can be achieved with dye based inks on those surfaces. Pleasantly surprised. If if you know if you're layering your colors. Okay, kind of working it down. I, I think what I'm going to do too um, on this one is I think I'm going to go into um, kind of a surface down here. All right. So what I mean by that is I'm going to mask off something like this right here. This one's a little bit too jagged. <laughs> that's good for us, something a little bit less. Something like this, okay? And I'm gonna, going to try to create um, kind of a surface of the ground that the tree is planted in, okay? So it'll look like it's underground. Maybe, I don't know. We'll see if it does or not. I think I'm going to have to go to black, too. And I, I would normally just pull this off and take a look, but I think it would be important that I <laughs> keep this mask in place, this paper towel mat. Okay, here we go. Just using the same part of that paper towel like that. It's a little bit too much contrast between this and up here. So we're going to use this too up here, okay? So utilize the drier version of this, okay? You don't have to re-ink uh, the super dark colors quite as much, especially if you've achieved a pretty deep saturation of tone 
on the surface and then the pulpier paper, okay? Because like I said, the more saturated this card becomes, this piece of paper becomes, um, the less ink you're transferring to it because, you know, it's wet on the surface or uh, a little bit damp on the surface. And it's damp in the pulp of the paper as well. All right. And when I go dark, I'm kind of, a well, quite a bit. I was going to say a little more perimeter-oriented, but I, I don't know. A lot more perimeter-oriented, probably. I'm not going into the scene quite as far. And if I go into it a little bit, I'm doing it with, you know, a really dry version of black here than, you know, a wet one, okay? But I do want to get a nice, strong vignette going. When you cap it off like that up there, and it's darker up there, it matches this bottom area down here uh, quite a bit more. Okay, So it'll bring a, a continuity into the piece. I'm always saying that word, continuity, because when it comes to a composition, um, we look at it in terms of sections and uh, making sure each section is how you want it to look, but you also want to have a really good idea of how what you're doing on a certain little area or section is affecting the overall. Okay. So as I'm doing this, I'm looking in this area here, but I, I'm looking at it as a whole quite a bit during this process right here. All right, but see this right here, this black, kind of do, per, you know, putting a lot of around the perimeter of this tree. Doesn't it make that tree kind of glow a little bit like that? It's like we're kind of framing it off in a, in a nice vignette, like a portrait of a tree, like a studio portrait of a tree or something like that. It's kind of bringing it a little bit to life like that. And it, I, hopefully it looks even better when I add that uh, white paint on it. See, it's an outline design, so we're kind of losing it. But that's where that white paint will come into play. I, I can't wait to use that. It's like we do all this work with the toning and all that. And, uh, yeah, but I, I think the, uh, the big technique that's going to be a lot of fun is the white paint pen. So it's like all of this work to, you know, kind of get that, uh, what'll, pro I don't know if it's going to be the exact last step, but one of the last steps. Um, it's just setting up the, uh, kind of the opportunity for that technique and application. All right. So do you see these kind of ovals sh showing up a little bit? It's like that. And then we, down here we have this. Okay. I, I, I haven't focused on the concept of lighting as much um, now that we've kind of worked into this. But as I always say in all of my videos, it's that oscillation. So we have this dark light, dark light, dark light light, dark, light, dark, and then light, and then dark again, right? So you just vary it. So we're coloring, but we're also lighting the scene. And lighting the scene just means the retention of some light areas within a given area, and those clouds. The clouds up here are one section, right? So there's light and dark in the clouds. This section right here is the stars, right? What do you have? You have light and dark. We have another bank of clouds like this, light and dark. And then down here we have this tree where it's light and then dark around here. There's a little bit of variation down here in the, uh, the soil area. It's a little bit lighter here and darker right here, but it's supposed to be underground, so it's darker overall. But we do have that variation. That's all you have to do. Um, when, when it, it'll give your pieces a certain type of sophistication 
and is it harder to do? It's not harder because in theory it's less work because see if I toned all that area out with color we I would have been putting on more ink right? So you just have to put on the brakes about where your things are. If it was a sun, star, a moon, it could be just an object, it could be a person that you don't tone out, you know. It could be your subject matter of your scene, which could be a, a animal or a bird or anything. It could be a house or something like that. And you just retain some areas of light in a given area, and you just surround it by darkness. So just don't tone everything out, is all. If I was doing a little child that had some clothes on and they had a jacket, let's say a blue jacket, you don't have to color in the whole thing. You can color it with a light color and have a little bit of darker around it. I see, you know, most people know how to do that, but, and they are lighting the scene, but sometimes when it comes to scenic stamping, if they're doing it for the first time, they, they don't kind of get that really what they've been doing all along with a little bit of tone on the outside of something to frame something off. That's all I'm doing right here. Okay. All right, now that's looking a little bit uh, anemic to me, although it is fairly rich. Okay, but what I want to do, I think this one's had it right here. I'm going to use some of this Caribbean blue. Actually, I have it right here in reinker form as well. Yeah, that might have been too much. <laughs> This Caribbean blue is really fantastic. It'll really warm things up. I might even go with some greens in here. I'm a little bit hesitant to go with that green color scheme because I just did that one in another uh, recent video, but I don't know, maybe I will. Caribbean blue has a, quite a bit more of that... Um, green mixed in with the blue, so it starts going into a bit of the analogous color, you know, to blue. And when you use analogous colors, greens and blues, reds and oranges, yellows and oranges, um, pink, violet, whatever, um, those types of things. Colors that are next to each other on the color wheel, it creates what we call a color glow. And that's what I really like doing. I, I think it's really fun working on um, with uh, dye-based inks and achieving that kind of color glow from the usage of a range of values, lights and darks, but also going into that, you know, next color on the color wheel. I don't know if I really want to go with this one. That one's really too bright. It's kind of extreme. Let's take a look and see what we have here in the... Uh, Distress inks. Okay, the distress inks are known for having a little bit more of a kind of a mellow type of uh, kind of signature look to them, right? They're supposed to look aged. Okay, let me try some of that right here. Okay, this is a peeled paint, but it's, you know, I don't know, kind of an olivey green. Let's, let's use a little bit of that in here. Yeah, it looks pretty good. I didn't get as... it was kind of darker than I thought it would go. Let's use some of that in here. I'm going into some of that really light area around those stars. Something like that. And I'll bring it down here into this tree for sure. I'm not going to take it everywhere. Retain your light areas. Alright, something like that. Um, okay, I'm going to give in. Let's go to that light green there. I think it maybe could use it. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, anytime you're kind of unsure about a color, just put it on a paper towel and just kind of take some of it off 
and then use a lighter version of it. I think that one's pretty dark. Or, I don't know, pretty bright, I should say. And just kind of take it in there. Like that, like so. Actually, that's helping, I think, there. This is kind of a transition color between that blue and the, the peeled paint, I think. The peeled paint was darker than I thought it would be, so... This one's really bright, though. I think we're looking at a very bright... A brighter scene than what I thought. Remember when I said I could still go green with this one? I think that's the direction we're going in. I mentioned this, I haven't mentioned it in a while, but um, this is a scene, this is an example of a scene kind of going a little bit in the direction that it seems to want to go in. I didn't want to go here, but I think the scene wanted to, so I'm accommodating it at some point in time. Um, It's almost like you're collaborating with, I don't know, whatever, the artistic spirit or whatever, or it's just you're collaborating with the scene. Sometimes the scenes will want to go in some direction sometimes that's a little bit counter to what you were thinking maybe in concept, okay? But you just kind of take it that way. Okay, now this is looking really great. So I'm going back to this blue right here and going even darker with this. So I'm going with the Prussian blue right here, okay? All right, so it's going to get fairly dark here. I'm just using that same paper towel that I started off with again. Yeah, you, you just have to, uh, you have to be a good and willing um, listener to your scenes a lot of times and just you know keep developing it or whatnot it'll it, it, at some point in time they'll kind of tell you what to do i don't hear voices or something like that but um a lot of times it's um a little bit more color or a darker in a certain area or more imagery sometimes something like that uh, sometimes it's just a matter of, yeah, that doesn't look as quite what you wanted. So you just kind of keep developing it and allowing it to go. Now, it's starting to come together for me now um, with this darker tone. Which is kind of interesting to me because I did go to black already, but using more of the darker blue here and going into the scene a little bit more with it, I think it's, it's doing the job here. Still really curious about that uh, tree and the white acrylic pen and what that's going to look like. I want it to look really, um, really, um, majestic, I guess, this word I'm looking for. Um, there's this, in Balboa Park here in San Diego, there's this old fig tree in the park. Huge! so enormous and I mean there's a couple of them but um, one of them I think is the more famous one but um, they have this thing called um, December nights um, once a year and this one I don't know individual or company that I guess specialize in kind of uh, lighting things up um, they go and let they have all these synchronized lights around that tree and they're playing music and um, there's laser lights on it, different colored lights, and 
the tree's bottom lit and whatnot. And it looks really cool. That's not what I'm doing here, but it's kind of in the same general spirit of a kind of a, I don't know, enhancing some sort of a, a tree figure. All right, there we go. My gosh, that really changed things around quite a bit. There we go. Now see that green, the reason why I did that, the greens kind of got, I don't know, they got a little bit, um, uh, a little bit muddy, okay? So I, I layered more of that toned down um, in the form of that really super lime green color and this is bottle green right here that I'm working on oh my gosh this bottle green is so wet and juicy I hardly ever use it but um, going with all those different lighter greens in there got it kind of muddy looking so you just go back in with a darker tone and you just kind of mellow all those areas out a little bit more by applying kind of a darker tinge on it. It just kind of brings everything together a little bit more. And going over some of those areas that were super bright green, it dulls them down a little bit. Okay, that is bottle green. It's the number 25. Marvy color. Let's go back to black here. Okay. Corners. And framing off of the tree. Around that tree. All right, there we go. Wow. That is a pretty deep <laughs> value, dark value. Look at this piece of paper right here. You can see all the different colors that were used on here. I don't know, does that look like it? Kind of. Some people used to tell me at conventions, you should say this and do something with this. Sometimes it almost looks like a, I don't know, like some tie-dyed piece of paper or something like that. All right, let's see here. Um, gosh. Now this is going to really stand out when I start adding that white paint into there, so I'm going to have to really bring some continuity to it by bringing in some uh, white paint marks up that way as well. Let's see which one of these paint pens is working good for me. These are the same pens, I just have a couple of them open at the same time. I think one of them was kind of running out of paint. These uh, paint pens come in a... Um, they come in different configurations. This one was an 8-pack here. And there were... Uh, where does it say? 
It doesn't even say on here. I, I think there was six white ones and two black ones. Those are, these are 0. 0.7 millimeter ones. Oh yeah, six white and two black. And I don't know. This one's like ten bucks or something like that. I, I forgot what you know how much it was when I bought it. It was something like ten dollars for eight pens. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of different types like this too. They're just called the white acrylic paint pen. This one's the Meows and if that's how you pronounce it. Okay, so I'm trying to get this flowing here. So okay, let me see if I can. I gotta move some stuff here. My desk is starting to look a lot, or starting to be really cluttered again. Okay, so I'm just going to go in here. Now these pens are supposed to be able to write on anything. Glass. Um, metal. I don't know, what else does it say? Glass. Uh, skin. Why would it be skin? That's what it says there. Cloth. Paper. Plastic, metal, and, and yeah, glass. So, I believe it to be an oil-based um, pen. Well, I don't know if it is. It's acrylic, though, right? So, I'm not really sure. Okay, I'm not trying to just color in everything. I'm kind of making this up on the fly, though. But um, since I'm going into these little offshoots right here... I'm not looking to fill it up exactly. I think that would look a little bit awkward. I don't think I'm going to color each leaf either. And I mean, this might be a good instance um, for um, different colored pens as well. I don't know if green will look good in here, maybe. I haven't used this stamp before, so I'm kind of unfamiliar with it in terms of getting kind of the flow of it down. Uh, I forgot the name of the artist. I'm going to try to do your design uh, justice here. Yeah, actually, it's looking pretty cool. Actually, look at that. That would have been cool if I did... Um, Kind of a lightning strike up here, huh? Because it's kind of looking kind of that type of thing down here. It really reiterate the forms of a kind of a lightning strike by doing this kind of reverse type of a touch here. Pretty good, uh, pretty nice flow to this tree here on the tree limbs. I'm pretty particular when it comes to trees. Um, there has to be a nice kind of flow and character to it, and this one has it in terms of a you know, continuity of a gesture and form. When I see trees that are that don't have that certain type of element. It's like, um, to me it looks like a, and it's used in a scene, it looks like a, I don't know, like going to see a ballet performance or something like that, but the performer has like a broken leg or something. <laughs> it, it doesn't, it doesn't have the gesture, uh, ideally. And in nature, this one's kind of more of a, it's more of a, like a caricature of a tree, but it has, you know, the spirit of a, a form. And I can tell they know what they're doing because they're, because the branches are, they're growing in certain directions. 
like a like a tree it really does and it has those offshoots so you know someone has observed nature in this uh in this illustration all right so see now that's kind of going like that and let's go down here to there I'm not sure if I'm going to fill this all in or if I'll leave it a little bit kind of scribblier like this. I'll try to uh, kind of reimagine the uh, the bark of the tree or maybe the knots and kind of getting into the spirit of the drawing, um, which will I will not be good at because I don't draw this way, but I'm trying to. Uh, figure it out as I go and reiterate some of the lines. I'm trying to capture some of the spirit of uh, the artist's intentions and kind of the flow that they gave to the, uh, the forms, which are really cool. I love these roots right here. And this totally uh, reminds me of the uh, those fig trees over at the park. There's just a whole elaborate system the tree itself, the trees themselves are really cool, but um, the roots themselves are almost, they have more gesture and spirit than the actual form of the tree in some ways. Or maybe because it's having to work into the, the soil and the landscape and work around uh, certain things. It's getting harder for me to kind of see because it, I got so dark down here, so I'm going to be missing something. So you don't have to stay right on something. It can just be, you know, you just kind of um, go along in the spirit of the piece, and some, and, you know, I might just start making up some of the, you know, some of the lines themselves. Okay, so that looks like that, but I mean, this alone up here. We need to draw in some of those leaves um, here and there. I wouldn't go, I mean, you could color everything in, do like some kind of Zen exercise, but I'm not going to do that here. So I'm going to try to, I'll do some and I'll just kind of cluster them to get uh, kind of the gist of it. So some of the leaves will just be darker, you know, it'll be the color of the ink that I've them up in. But I'll try to get some of these more prominent ones that are right, um, you know, next to some of the more um, kind of focal point branches or some of the significant branches. So see I'm just kind of going in there and doing that type of thing. All right, let's see. I have to work upside down sometimes to get, you know, better uh, access to certain parts of the design. You don't always have to work with your pieces facing directly up. I say that I'm not going to do every one of these, but um, it's kind of fun drawing these in, so I don't know, we'll see how, just if I get carried away or not. If I do, we'll time lapse this. I don't know how you end up doing those time lapse videos anyways, but. What I'm thinking though, I need to go, 
need to do these perimeter ones so we can see that form. If I, do, if I just kind of keep it in the interior, we don't see that, that overall shape of the tree, which is you know, a significant part of the, uh, the spirit of it. So I do think I need to go up quite a bit. But it's hard to see because it starts getting really dark out there and seeing these kind of thin lines around uh, the perimeter is a little bit difficult. I've never used this white paint pen as much <laughs> before. I don't think I, I've used uh, white paint pens and gel pens a lot in my day. I don't think I've ever used it quite as much as this, though. It's working great, though. Sometimes it's clogging on me a little bit, so if you see me kind of scribbling like this a little bit, um, it gets the, uh, the dry... Um, acrylic paint that I've kind of gone over and it uh, it just kind of gets it off that tip there and creates that flowing area again. You have to shake these up every time you use them. I would even shake it up probably again if I used it today um, because the ink in here um, separates from the binder or the paint so you have to shake it up every time. It'll give you a more opaque mark by doing so. That being said, I guess if you want it more translucent, then don't shake it up as much and it'll get a less than white uh, mark. The more I do this, the more I see that uh, tree too. The more I draw here, I'm getting more when I say see it, I, I mean, I'm getting more familiar with the forms of the artist that the artist has used. So I'm kind of getting the pattern down. It's becoming a little bit faster for me, and I can see them, what their kind of idea was. Okay, now out here it gets really dark, though, so I'm going to have to make it up as I go in some areas. I think I've almost gone over this entire tree. Look at that. Okay. It's kind of fun, though. Let me try something here. I don't know if this will, how this will look, but this is, um, well, this is a, this is a gel pen here. Let me, I think it'd be easier with my, uh, with my Sharpie. Um, water-based extra fine paint pen here. And this one's, what do they call it? Aqua. Turquoise. Okay. Let me see if this, this will add anything to the, uh, the piece. Yeah. It's another paint pen, so be sure you shake these up. These come in a, uh, in a pack. It's like a 
four or five pack of pastel colors. So you have your pink, kind of a tan, blue, and green. They're really fantastic. I've been using these for a really long time at this point in time. and uh, They work quite well. Actually, wiping it off like that, I must have. Did I just clog it? Here, let me get this going here. I might have pinched the... Uh, Opening. No, it looks like I need to shake that up a little bit more. Okay, there we go. All right, let me let me get some of these uh, leaves in here. Yeah, it looks okay. Yeah, actually, it does. It's 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 a real subtle. This green, this aqua, is almost the same hue uh, value. As some of the background um, colors that have already been laid down so it doesn't show up too much but actually it looks pretty good the more that I apply it and some of these leaves that I already colored or the ones that I didn't color yet okay let me show you if you can see this One of you that's familiar with um, using Frisk is saying, you know what? Using the Frisk would have been faster. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't think I'd be coloring every single little leaf here. I don't know if I'm doing every single one, but it's. I don't know. There's a lot of them. But it just. I don't know. It became kind of meditative. It's like the Zen of coloring or something like that. And if you're watching this video, you're, you're a stamp aircrafter, you know what I mean when uh, kind of you look up and it's, you know, more hours than you thought have gone by, so. Yeah, that green really helped out. Thing that I the thing that I want uh, is to in doing all this work on there. I'm hoping I'm retaining the spirit of the, uh, the original drawing by that uh, by the artist. I, I need to like take a look at the name again. I've already forgot. But um, I think it, I think it looks like that tree, doesn't it? Still, no. I mean, it looks different, but I think it still captures the spirit of that drawing right there. Okay, now we have that shape right there, and it is completely looking unrelated to the rest of the piece, doesn't it? It looks like just something that's not, you know, doesn't have any kind of continuity with the surrounding area. Okay, now I don't want it to have, I don't want it to completely blend in, but I do want it to have a little bit more continuity than what it has right now, which is you know, none or very little because it's done in a different spirit. So what you do is you just, we're going to bring in some additional, is this a pen I was using or is it the other one? We're going to give this some additional forms like this, okay? Now this is the starburst stamp, so you can go in, you can reiterate that idea of some stars in here. Like this, okay. I, I think the bleed proof white will look really good in here too, so I'll use some of that. If you've seen my videos before, you'll know what I'm talking about, but I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, I'm going for different sizes of uh, these old dots here, okay. I want some larger ones. I want this to be a little bit more exaggerated than a lot of times what I do. Just because of this down here, it's, you know, kind of an exaggerated version of that tree. We've really kind of enhanced it. Okay. I'm 
I'm smearing some of this. Some of I've, I've gone over it with my hand and it smeared the star, but oh well. I kind of cluster them a little bit too, but see that? It's bringing a little bit more continuity into it. All right, this will bring, hopefully, should be, bring a lot of continuity to these two sections right here. And then we'll finish it off with some white pigment ink, which will be, I think, the finishing touches on here. So this is a bleed-proof white and my trusty old toothbrush. I wonder how long I've been using that same toothbrush. It was, it's really just an old toothbrush. I didn't kind of buy a specific one for this. I've just, I don't know, been using the same one for a long time. Okay, adding a little bit of water to this uh, bleed-proof white, which is an opaque white watercolor paint. And just get it the right consistency. You want it a little bit thick, kind of like a like a thin syrup or something like that. Or you can make it as thick, you know, real thick syrup too, but um, you just want it to get where it can, it'll flick off of your... Um, toothbrush here. So load it up. Well, don't load it up all the way. I just kind of get it right on the tip right there. I don't know if this is focusing right there. Can you see it right there? It's on the tip there. And then just kind of, you know, get some of it out of there too, because you don't want a big blob of paint on your scene at any given time, <laughs> but especially towards, you know, the latter part of the, uh, the process. If it does drip out, though, this, if you're doing this on glossy cardstock or a coated cardstock, it will wipe off, or it should. You can kind of sop it up as, you know, when it's wet, or when it dries, you can just buff it right off and kind of do it over again, if you do get kind of some obtrusive type of mark. Okay, so hopefully I've taken off enough. One of these days I'm going to say all that, and I'm going to get this big blob. I don't think that's happened yet, but should happen at some point in time okay all right so i'm just i'm holding this up so to try and get out of the glare so you can see it as apply as it happens okay but watch my thumb here i'm not just going full back and splattering everything it's just a little bit i'm just releasing a couple bristles at a time okay this is just kind of a texture to Oh, sorry. This is kind of a texture, see, as it goes in here. See that? It can, so it intersperses with the dots that I've already laid down. Doesn't it look a little bit more natural? Now, I don't know what this is supposed to be. It's just another texture. It's not, we don't have to think about it like, uh, wait a minute, is that snow there or something like that? I don't know. It's just a kind of a texture to bring everything together a lot more. It's bringing um, a common texture and uh, I don't know, it's not really pattern, but um, I don't know, another layer, I guess, textural layer that's in both areas. Got to kind of put the brakes on it at some point in time because it starts getting really busy. But I think that's good enough. Let's take a look at this. All right, okay. Actually, I think a little bit more in here. When I do this at uh, conventions, when I talk about splatter painting, when I pull that out, sometimes people that are already like five feet away from me kind of start backing up. It's not that uncontrolled. It's just going in this like little area right here. And like I said, I'm not just going like, shh, you know, and splattering it, uh, you know, just kind of holding my breath or something like that. It's, sl you know, there's a certain degree of uh, uh, randomness uh, that comes about from that, but um, you know you are in control of a lot of it. You know, just by releasing a couple bristles at a time, it's not any uh, 
type of big thing. You know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm going to do these little fairy types of glowing little spheres in here. So I'm going to have these larger dots um, that are in the sky there, but they're also down here. Okay, so this is giving uh, creating a little bit more shape variation. Kind of some of these stars kind of within the tree itself. It, I couldn't tell um, what those were on the, uh, the tree, but it looked like it might have had some, it might have or something, some kind of like fruit on it or something like that. So I don't know if that is. It's just some kind of ornamental form in there, kind of decorative uh, pattern that's pretty cool. So I'm just kind of adding that in there as well to uh, uh, reiterate the form or whatever. Okay, so let's see. I think I threw away my old cotton ball from my previous videos. I use those ones to death because um, sometimes the used cotton ball works better than kind of a new one. But you have to get a new one every now and then. Okay. 100% cotton. All right. And I say that if you haven't watched a vid my videos before of where I've used this. It just the, the real cotton for this type of technique right here that I'm about to do, it just seems to... This one's like an acrylic ball right here. And I don't know. It, it seems to resist the media a little bit, you know, because it's not absorbent like cotton. So I get a softer look with real cottons. I don't know. You can try whatever you have, um, but that's, I don't know, that's from my experience. And the same thing with the uh, cotton swab, you know, real cotton one works, seems to work better. Okay, now I'm going to blot this off quite a bit right here. Okay. And where dark meets light, okay, or where light meets dark. I'm going to apply some of the... You're not going to be able to see a lot of this um, because it's going to be fairly subtle, I think, where I use this, okay? But right around by stars, the brightest of areas, there, the areas that I've retained some of the lightness and in those clouds right there, I'm going to apply some of this ink to reiterate the lighting because this isn't like a real strong, opaque white. Wherever I apply this, the colors underneath are going to show right through the white, okay? So this just kind of reiterates the lighting and makes the lighting a lot softer looking, which I think kind of adds to this uh, overall spirit of this piece. I know I do it on all my pieces, so you can say the spirit of the piece is the same in every one of them, I guess, but... I just kind of like that softer light. Let's take a look and see if you can see it. Okay, so you see the difference between this cloud right here and this one, or this one right here? Let's see if we can see it here. Does it, I mean, that looks different than that, right? And I put it right here, too. That area looks different than this, right? I mean, you can leave some of it as is, where there's a little bit of contrast, but I tend to like that look right there, okay? So let's do it on this one right here. It, it's not real light there, but... We can lighten it up a little bit, but it's important that I re did retain some of the white there because if you're putting this white pigment ink over the top of it, it kind of, it says that there's that color of lighting in that space, okay? See that right there? See how it's a little bit softer now? Okay, so it's not like some... Now, a lot of you have, like, really super juicy white pigment ink pads because you don't use them a lot. 
Okay, I've had some 20 year pads that I, I'm still using. Okay, I don't use them a lot. So just be careful that you don't kind of ink something up and just go straight into it and then you can see these blobs everywhere. Paint. So all you need to do is blot it off a little bit. And it kind of pushes the pigment ink back into the, uh, the surface of your applicator. And it makes it, it evens it out a little bit too. It, and then by tapping it down like that, you're kind of flattening the surface and getting that surface um, kind of in an ideal um, consistency. And it, like I said, it's, it's spreading out the ink evenly on there. Okay. So a few taps like that. That's, you know, yeah, that's your technique like that. So tap it off more if you have way too much ink on there. Okay, but see that right there? Now doesn't that little area seem a little bit more dreamy with that white pigment ink on there? Same thing around the stars. See how the, they look really soft in that lighting. It's a real soft lighting. Okay, now I think that will look really good back in here too, okay? I didn't leave a lot of white back in there, but it is lighter in that tree, and I'll just kind of I'll make it a little bit lighter in the center, and then I'll kind of spread it around a little bit. And I think it'll kind of be interesting looking, having this tree kind of feel like it's emanating light. You know, I could have colored that. If it was a lighter um, background, I could have colored in this tree black maybe after putting on this ink and it would look like it's backlit I mean, now this is white and it's backlit white but um, I know it'd be kind of interesting too having it dark against uh, black, uh, light like that see so like that doesn't it kind of give that a little bit of continuity let's see what this looks like like that okay I think it looks pretty good. Let's go with it, with it even more. Okay. Kind of mellow, mellows things out a, a little bit too. Um, with all that, you know, sharp um, paint pen usage in there. Gel pen, or the, you know, the the green gel uh, paint pen. You see, used to using gel pens. Um, but those marks are all very exact, where everything else has kind of a different kind of spirit to it. So this is kind of giving it that same spirit as well, giving it some continuity again. All right, your cotton swab here. And let's go back to those real, the larger stars or spheres or whatever, OK? Let's do it this way so I can get more on camera. Okay. See, I'm really taking a lot of that ink off, and I'm priming that tip of that Q-tip right there. If you need to, kind of fray it a little bit. You see how kind of frayed that is? That one's a little bit newer. It's kind of coming unraveled a little bit as well. But this is pretty unraveled right here. You don't want the stick of the, you know, the cardboard stick to be poking through, but um, you kind of want, this is almost too frayed. <laughs> Maybe it's too frayed. Let's see if this works. Okay, I think that was like 15 taps right there for that um, star, okay? So that's, see, that's where you have a lot of control over it. Where people have a kind of a harder time controlling this type of thing is when they, it's, a big blob of paint. Now watch this. It's 10. Okay, that's 23 taps right there just to get that little glow right there. It doesn't mean it took, you know, it doesn't take a long time. It's a few seconds. But you have a lot of control over it that way. And you never have to worry about kind of the amount that you use because you can just see it kind of coming into focus ever so slow, uh, slightly or slowly. OK. 
Yeah. See these little spheres like that? Don't they kind of become the kind of the, the I don't know, somewhat of a the point of the focal points. I don't know, there's so many of them, I don't want to say they're they're the focal point, but they certainly become kind of an integral player within the scene. Now if you want one that's kind of more off in the distance or something like that or whatever, you can just do it a couple taps like that and it creates that little just slight glow to it. Okay, so different amounts. It was like three kind of light taps. and I haven't re-inked this either, so... Okay, so one right there. Working down. I was tempted to re-ink, but let's just keep going with uh, that same inking. Just for the sake of, you know, just showing how far you can take it with one inking. I think I'm going to make these little stars on the uh, tree limbs a little bit brighter. It's almost like that's where these stars are growing on this tree and kind of floating up into space. I, want, I think that's the, uh, the uh, um, that's the look I want to uh, to convey. So I think we have our uh, kind of our theme of this one. Okay, it's like the stars are grown on the tree there, and they're kind of going up into the sky. Okay, I think I need some more dull ones up there. They're all the same kind of. Uh, vibrancy or light lightness. I think we need some lighter ones in the distance and or just duller ones in general. These are like star apples or something. Except they don't fall down, they fall, they go up. Yeah, let's put some more down here. Let's let's put a little let's put a little mist down here. This area down here, I mean, it looks okay, but I think it can look a little bit better. Let's put a little bit of a like a transitioning mist on the ground or something like that. create a little bit of a transition between ground and sky by masking off down here. Yeah, that's pretty fun. This is not the same mask that I used uh, to mask off that area down here when I was coloring. But it just comes to show you don't need the same one. Interesting. 
Let's use a little bit more of this white pigment ink up here. I'm adding some more of it up here because I added that down there. Let's actually go ahead and do this up here. I really like that kind of look. Let's see, how should we do this? Let's do this right here. I got too clean of a rip. <laughs> Why don't work? If you, if you rip a paper towel kind of in one direction, there's a certain type of... Uh, um, Uh, grain to it. I couldn't really think, of, think of the word. It rips real cleanly in one direction, but if you go in the other direction, it, you get that kind of grain. It's a little bit more jagged. In this case, I'm going for the a little more jagged tear. Yeah, see that right there? We can layer it too. Let's let's layer it a little bit. Let's go like this. Let's flip this around and go for Yeah. Let's see. How about this right here? I think this is the first time I've done some of these things like this. And I do this some of this, this type of thing in this on the ground sometimes. I don't think I've done it in the sky before. So like I said, you know, um, you kind of have to listen to your scenes sometimes and see what's developing. See that little thing down there? I don't know if I like that that much, but let's try it up here too. I just felt um, it needed a little bit more texture somewhere. Yeah. See, so stuff going on up in the sky. See, I came, like, here. The mask was right here. Right here. And let's do this. Let's go... Let's go a little bit. Let's kind of keep it in that same direction. But let's do that right across that tree, I think. Like that. I'll keep it subtle. <laughs> first of all, I don't know if I'm going to like it or not, so I'm just going to put a very light version of it down first. Yeah, like that. Okay, so see I did that right there. And then it continues out there. Let's go like this right here. I don't know. I think it kind of it makes it a little bit more interesting. It seems a little bit more landscaped up there. Of course, this is in the sky, so it's like skyscaped. But um, I don't know. It kind of creates a little bit more um, more distance. I think. Depth. Creates more depth. Okay. God, I went crazy with that. Whew. All right. Let me take a look here and see what we have. These big pieces, I can't even get it all on screen at one time.
All right, I think that is done. That white pigment ink is going to dry darker than how it looks, you know, when it's been freshly applied. So it'll, it'll kind of mellow into it a little bit more. But I think that'll look good. And then when you spray it, too, with a spray sealant, that won't show up as much. But let's take a look at this. This, believe it or not, is just three stamps on here. Cloud Cumulus, Starbirth, and that tree down there. So... A lot of it is just your toning in, <laughs> which I, I used a lot more colors than I thought I was going to. And I used a lot, I used a lot more of everything that I'm going into it. I don't, I don't know why I always underestimate. I should know by now just how much I'm going to uh, apply of something, but I don't know. I, I'm, I'm clueless when it comes to that. I tend to get uh, carried away. But... Um, A lot more tone, a lot more of the uh, acrylic paint pen work, a lot more masking, but I think it all added up into a really fun composition right here. And uh, believe it, everything that I did here is fairly simple in terms of the, uh, the process. It's just that there's a lot of it. There was a lot of ink that's been applied, okay? And doing, like, one little leaf is no different than doing the hundredth or whatever, okay? I did it in two different colors in this case, just white and green. Um, the white is pretty opaque. I thought it'd be a little bit more translucent, but I guess I shook it up enough. But the uh, the white pigment ink in here is certainly easy to apply. It's just a very light shade of it, and you just tap it around, but you oscillate it. Okay, here's none right here, here's some right here, none. It's mostly on the perimeter where there isn't too much of it. But on the inside here, that kind of that frostier type of haze, like that. Um, in addition to it being in the tree right here, it gives these area is a little bit more continuity. That tree still stands out quite a bit, though, because of the line work of the, the pen, okay? But having that texture in there of that soft pigment ink um, brings it together a little bit more. And then, of course, these, these dots that are uh, throughout the piece are about the same thickness as most of these branches, so that's where that kind of brings a little continuity into it, in addition to these little glowing balls. You can't really see them as well in here. Here, 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 here. Um, but having those throughout the tree brings that continuity in terms of a shape and texture, you know, a little glowing little texture uh, to the overall piece. And that's, I don't know, it's kind of important. Like I said, that tree really stands out though in terms of a different look in here, but I think there's enough continuity to bring the piece together. So anyways, now, I'm not going to do those beams in here, but you could do those um, white pigment ink beams coming out of there for a really super dramatic effect. But I, I didn't want to go for that one on this one. And plus, like I said, I just did that in the last scene in addition to a uh, similar color scheme, so I don't want to just, I don't know. I get bored of doing the exact same thing uh, time after time. So I kind of like to switch it up a little bit. But um, I don't know, just a really fun thing, thanks to... Uh, Rubber Moon for supplying me with this set of cool looking images. And they're done by Sandra Evertson, Evertson. Okay. And again, this is the earth. Okay. It's the, that's the tree. That's what they call it. It's the, uh, the earth, um, image from the elements collection okay there's a lot more in here too but uh we went with the tree first and i have fun with it i haven't done this kind of process before especially in coloring in that uh, tree right there but i thought it'd be perfect for this um type of background and whatnot to um you know check it out so thanks for watching hope you enjoyed it and uh I have a lot of editing to do on this video. I need to uh, time-lapse even the 
the full length version of this uh, video, uh, lest everyone I, I put everyone to sleep. So, as always, thanks for tuning into the channel. If you have any questions, drop me a note in the comment section. And if you ever try anything on any of my videos, and if you ever run into kind of any kind of difficult or whatnot, trying to get some of these techniques down. The best thing is just to take, most people have camera phones, um, take a photograph of it and send it to me at stampscapes at gmail.com. You can see all the information underneath this video in terms of uh, contact information. And I'll take a look at it and see what you've done. And I'll, I don't know, I'll give you my uh, two cents on um, ways to... Um, improve what you've done or to make what you've done easier because I can usually tell what's gone on if I see a visual of what someone's done. Okay, so thanks again for watching. Thanks again for tuning into the channel.